Module 10, Relational Summary Lecture, GWE2, No More Bullcrap. This lecture is about cows and cow pies and bulls and bullcrap, and not just the crap from the livestock, but also about the crap that we're directly responsible for after every meal. And when I'm talking shit, I mean it ecologically. We can leave the other kind of bull hockey for the politics sections of this course. So what is it about cows that makes them such a problem? particularly here in the Wild West, cowboy. With regards to climate change, of course, the issue is the methane that they belch out. Now, some people say farting cows are the problem, but most of the methane is coming out of their mouths, not their butts. Little known fact. Regardless, the CH4 molecule is said to be 23 to 80 times more potent as a greenhouse gas than mere CO2, depending on who you ask and how they calculate. So when scientists initially calculated the global warming uh, potential of the number of molecules of CH4 that an average cow emits per day, roughly 500 liters worth a day, by the number of cows in the world, roughly a billion or one-eighth of the number of humans, it seemed to be catastrophic. The BBC reports, quote, the average ruminant produces 250 to 500 liters of methane a day. Globally, livestock are responsible for burping and a small amount of farting, the methane equivalent of 3.1 gigatons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere annually." End quote. Now, forget the fact that we humans also fart and belch, releasing approximately 0.12 kilograms per day of methane. Each of us releases approximately 1,000 times less methane than your average heifer. So even though there are roughly eight times more people than cows on the earth, we still aren't considered problems yet. Well, I mean, concerning the methane that comes out of our butts, I mean. Our release of fossil methane, of course, is another story. According to a recent article in Science, the background leakage of methane from all non-human sources really doesn't make that much of a difference. Quote, in a second study, the same team harvested ice from Greenland to estimate how much modern atmospheric methane comes from leaks and extraction operations and pipelines versus natural geologic seeps from the Earth. Because both types lack carbon-14, the scientists compared levels of carbon-14 depleted methane from the 1870s with levels from when the fossil fuel era was in full swing, in the decades leading up to the 1940s. Now, later years were avoided because they're skewed by nuclear weapons testing, which boosts carbon-14 levels. The data reveal that levels of carbon-14 depleted methane were much lower in the 1870s. And that means modern geologic sources of methane are much smaller than previously estimated, and that the big jump came from humans, they reported this week in Nature. They estimate, they estimate annual geologic methane emissions at about 1.6 million tons, dramatically lower than recent estimates of between 30 million and 60 million tons per year. Methane released from all sources totals approximately 570 million tons a year. And that's from sciencemag.org. The thing is, this field of climate change is very dynamic, as all sciences are. Just the other day, a study was cited in an article called New Methane Math Could Take the Heat Off Cows. The issue is that methane rapidly degrades in the atmosphere. It isn't persistent like CO2. The article tells us, quote, globally, Livestock contribute 14.5% of total annual greenhouse gas emissions, with methane comprising 44% of that, according to the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, the FAO report, tackling climate change through livestock. But Allen argues any discussion about methane emissions must include how it works differently in our atmosphere than the primary climate change culprit, carbon, carbon dioxide. Methane is a short-lived flow gas in our atmosphere with 28 times the warming potential of CO2, but this is only true for a short time, only 10 years, according to the UC Davis Center for Clarity and Leadership in Environmental Awareness and Research, aka CLEAR. Carbon dioxide, on the other hand, is a stock gas. It persists in the atmosphere for hundreds of thousands of years, creating a cumulative effect, Allen says. That means each ton of carbon dioxide released adds more warming than the ton before it, and so on and so on. So even though methane initially has a more significant warming effect than CO2, because it, 
because it dissipates in the atmosphere in a short time, it creates a pulse effect on global temperatures when a new additional source of methane is released versus the cumulative effect of CO2 releases. As long as methane emissions don't increase, if say herd sizes stay stable, for instance, then Allen explains temperature increases caused by methane won't keep building up because the methane is oxidizing from the atmosphere as it is being added. The article doesn't talk about another way that methane is removed from the ecosystem via the activity of abundant methanotrophic microbes. This reality was first brought to my attention when visiting the laboratory of Dr. Martin Denneke at the University of Essen in Germany with Dr. Katie Walter Anthony, with whom I had done methane capture work in Western Alaska on a National Geographic grant. Dr. Anthony is investigating how much methane is being released to our atmosphere in the Northwest as the permafrost of places like Alaska and the Arctic Circle thaw because of global warming. This could create, okay, let's say is creating, a catastrophic feedback loop as the new methane abets the melting, which in turn releases more methane, eons of methane that was supposedly permanently trapped beneath the so-called permafrost, which is no longer either frost or permanent, as we've said. We actually went out on the frozen lakes, punched holes in the ice, and lit the lake on fire to show how much is there. So our project was to try and offset some of that release since there's no feasible way to cover the entire permafrost or thermokarst lakes and capture that gas. Our goal is to encourage society to turn as much organic material as we can deliberately into methane that we can burn into CO2 and water vapor to create electricity and drive motors and heat water for homes and industry and thereby offset the amount of fossil carbon we normally use to do those activities. It is an ambitious and urgent plan, so I took Katie to meet with Dr. Denneke after we spent time touring some of Western Germany's many biodigesters that process city food waste into clean fuel and fertilizer. As Dr. Denneke took us through his two-story laboratory filled with tanks bubbling with Frankenstein-like measuring apparatus, he explained how he had developed a 3A process for breaking down literally all organic materials, including the intransigent lignocellulose of urban tree branches and leaves and yard trimmings that pile up everywhere in the world as humans struggle to keep nature under control and neat and tidy. Now, normally, biodigesters can't do anything with all that tightly layered carbon, so it's either burned, sending smoke and CO2 into po and poisonous carbon monoxide into the air, or it's piled up and left to rot, which also sends the CO2 up, albeit more slowly, but doesn't do anything to help offset the CO2 from fossil fuels. But Dr. Denneke's dry a 3A process has three phases, an aerobic phase for 24 to 36 hours that degrades the lignocellulose into more digestible molecules, then an anaerobic phase where for 40 days and 40 nights the archaean methanogens, which would have been on Noah's Ark in the guts of every cow, sheep, goat, and other animal, fermented into usable methane-rich biogas, which is used to offset fossil fuels. And finally, it goes through another couple of days of aerobic processing to get an odor-free and nutrient-rich liquid compost fertilizer. With Denneke's process, there isn't anything that was once alive and has recently died that can't be used to offset the use of things that were once alive but died millions of years ago and turned into coal, oil, and so-called natural gas. <clears throat> Denneke took us downstairs into a room that looked like something out of a James Bond movie and said, here I am doing experiments that we are applying to landfills to stop their methane release. Obviously here in Germany we are making good progress diverting all food waste in grocery store and farm waste to biodigesters instead of landfills. Back in the year 2000, we had only about 800 commercial scale biodigesters like the Ibram and Plani T digesters you have visited this week. And now we have well over 15,000 and growing. In Sweden, trucks and cars and buses run on biogas. Europe takes this very seriously. In June of 2020, the EPA meanwhile reports, quote, biogas collected from the anaerobic digester systems is often used to generate electricity to fuel boilers or furnaces or to provide combined heat and power. And as of January 2019, there are 248 operating digesters on livestock farms in the United States, only 248. And urban biodigesters are sadly almost non-existent with the exception of the few, like the Harvest Power Digesters at Disney World and the ones Quasar Energy operates in Ohio to handle the food waste from the Cleveland Browns games at First Energy Stadium. Way to go, Ohio. Hopefully, 
theme park operators like Disney and the Green Sports Alliance, a nonprofit group created by Microsoft Corporation co-founder Paul Allen's Vulcan Inc. and the Natural Resources Defense Council, can make such digesters the new normal for big event spaces. But we, the people, the American people, really need to step up. And of course, the easiest thing we can do is to use our insincorator food grinders, aka garbage disposals, and wash and clean all our plastic residuals so every bit of organic material is washed down the sink and can get to the anaerobic digesters found at every wastewater treatment plant rather than ending up in landfill. That is a huge and simple drawdown solution. Now, Dedeke reminded us that putting plastic, which is essentially just solid oil, into a landfill does not release much of any methane since it takes so long to degrade, and neither do metal, brick, and cement, and glass, and ceramics, which are too valuable to throw in a landfill and too easy to recycle. Therefore, if everyone uses the dry ah method, then all the organic material, all food and toilet waste and animal waste and crop residues and tree and shrub trimmings and leaves and cut grass and weeds and even wood and cardboard and paper can be turned into fossil fuel offsetting renewable biomethane and methanol and derivatives like dimethyl ether or DME. With this simple switch, landfills shouldn't be a problem anymore. But Dr. Denicky said there are still thousands of landfills that have been accumulating organic waste for decades, and even when they close them, they still emit methane until every last gram of organic material we carelessly put in them has decomposed. Now, he said, like many countries, we do try to tap into that, and so we cover the landfills with a membrane, and we capture that landfill gas and use it to run generators, so that's good. I said, yes, we do that in California, too. When I, was a when I was teaching global environment courses at UCLA, we took our students on a tour of the campus environmental activities and also to wastewater treatment plants. And this was in the years from 2000 to 2003. And we were shown that the Institute of the Environment building was powered and heated and cooled by methane turbines fueled by the nearby landfill. Exactly, said Denicky. But the problem comes towards the end of the landfill's life. At some point, the amount of organic material still producing methane starts to drop, and it gets to the point where it is no longer cost-effective to capture. At that point, the economics deter us from doing any further mitigation, but the landfill is still producing volumes that pose a serious danger to our environment through global warming. So I and my team have developed these plastic lattices impregnated with methanotrophic microbes that we can place on top of the landfill to degrade the remaining methane into CO2 and water and biomass as it comes out until there is no more methane to degrade. After half a decade of working with methanogens to make methane, this was the first I had heard of harnessing methanotrophs that eat methane. And it turns out they aren't exotic or hard to come by at all. Methanotrophs live everywhere in natural ecosystems. Wikipedia tells us, quote, Methanotrophs, sometimes called methanophils or methanophiles, are prokaryotes that metabolize methane as their source of carbon and energy. They can be either bacteria or archaea and can grow aerobically or anaerobically and require single carbon compounds to survive. So it turns out, that this is a rather general strategy among two of life's five kingdoms. How hopeful is that? It further tells us, quote, methanotrophs are especially common in or near environments where methane is produced, although some methanotrophs can oxidize atmospheric methane. Their habitats include wetlands, soils, marshes, rice paddies, landfills, aquatic systems, lakes, oceans, streams, and more. The more can include presence in the air and clouds, and this is currently under investigation with promising results, as stated in the article, viable methanotrophic bacteria enriched from air and rain can oxidize methane at cloud-like conditions in Aerobiologia, in Aerobiologia, Aerobiologia, volume 29, pages 373 to 384. The authors of that study say, we demonstrate here for the first time that viable methanotrophic bacteria are present in air and rain and thus expand our knowledge on the global distribution of methanotrophs to include the atmosphere. The fact that they can degrade methane to below atmospheric concentrations when inoculated into artificial cloud water leads to an important possible effect of these organisms. 
The atmosphere may not only function as a medium for microbial dissemination, but also as a site of active microbial methane turnover. So perhaps biogenic methane isn't such a worry after all. Does that mean we don't have to worry about cows at all? Well, I've argued that the culprit isn't cows per se, but CAFOs, which confine, confine the cows so they can't perform their ecological functions and force them to eat unnatural amounts of fossil fuel grown grains, which themselves represent a net CO2 contribution, producing methane that is unavailable to methanotrophs that are naturally present in and above the pastures that would degrade it faster. You see, the issue, as stated in the Aerobiologia research, is active microbial methane turnover. Once again, it's all about rate. As Joe Biden would say, Nasi, here's the deal. We have the solutions. You have 100 of them right there in black and white and living color in your Jawdown textbook and the website. There will be nothing to worry about if we implemented them in a timely manner. The Drawdown solution ranked way up at number 11, regenerative agriculture, is the subject of the documentary we keep mentioning, Kiss the Ground. And it reduces carbon by 23.15 gigatons at a net cost of $57.2 billion with a net savings of $1.93 trillion. That one pencils out for sure. Regenerative agriculture, quote, brings the carbon back home. The book tells us that Professor Ratan Lal estimates that at least 50% of the carbon in the Earth's soils has been released into the atmosphere over the past centuries, approximately, one, sorry, approximately 80 billion tons. Bringing that carbon back into the soil is a gift to the atmosphere, to be sure. But from a practical agricultural perspective, they say it is an invitation to farmers to move away from agrochemical farming and bring the carbon back home, where it will help them work with the land more efficiently and productively. When carbon is stored in soil organic matter, microbial life proliferates, soil texture improves, roots go deeper, worms drag organic matter down their holes and make rich castings of nitrogen, nutrient uptake is enhanced, water retention increases several fold, creating drought tolerance or flood insurance. Nourished plants are more pest resistant and fertility compounds to the point where little or no fertilizers are necessary. This ability to become independent of fertilizers relies upon cover crops. Each additional percent of carbon in the soil is considered equivalent to $300 to $600 of fertilizer stored beneath. Cover crops sown into harvested plant residues crowd out weeds. Experimentation has taught regenerative farmers to plant cover crops containing 10 to 25 different varieties, each one adding a particular quality or nutrient to the soil. Gabe Brown, a renowned regenerative farmer in North Dakota, once put 70 different varieties in his seed box for pasturage. The possibilities include legumes such as spring peas, clover, vetch, cowpeas, alfalfa, mung beans, lentils, fava beans, sanfuin, and sun hemp, and brassicas such as kale, mustard, radish, turnips, and collards. And then there are broad leaves such as sunflower, sesame, and chicory, and grasses such as black oats, rye, fescue, teff, brome, and sorghum. Each plant brings distinct additions to the soil from shading out weeds to fixing nitrogen and making mm -hmm. phosphorus, zinc, or calcium bioavailable. And it stops droughts and floods. I mean, where's the, where's the loss? And here's where the cows come in. They say, quote, when consumed by ruminants, diverse varieties of cover crops afford extraordinary nutrition. This has been called salad bar beef by legendary regenerative farmer Joel Salatin of Polyface Farms. By recognizing the real needs of farm animals and increasing the amount of biodiversity on the farm to feed them, the whole rainforest beef dilemma and the danger of habitat loss is diminished or eliminated. And of course, the ruminants, the cows and bulls, add most of that extraordinary nutrition back to the soil through their trampled in manures, especially when the cows are followed by other animals. Joel Salatin doesn't just radically increase the types of plants on the land for that salad bar beef, but the types of animals as well. By releasing chickens and turkeys and ducks and geese right after the cow rotation, he ensures that they get fed for free, picking through the manure for soldier fly larvae and other maggots and scratching the nutrient-rich manure fertilizer back into the soil. It's free labor. Part of this process involves what is called managed grazing, which, drawdown solution, which is drawdown solution number 19 in importance, taking up 16.34 gigatons of CO2 at a net cost of $50.5 billion, with a net savings of $735.3 billion. 
Our text says, quote, ruminants, mammals that ferment cellulose, co-created the world's great grasslands, from the pampas in Argentina to the mammoth steppe in Siberia. Put those animals inside a fence, and it's a whole different story. Worse still, if you place cattle in feedlots and measure their impact upon the environment and climate, they rank with coal as being one of the greatest detriments to the planet. What has become apparent, however, is that when cattle and other ruminants are managed on grasslands in a holistic way, it can be the best thing for the land." End quote. Now the book explains that just as overgrazing is bad for land and carbon sequestration, so is undergrazing. As with many things in sustainability, there's an art and a science to this. When dealing with human impacted systems, it requires intelligent management to get things back in balance. But it's not as if we can't do it. Homo sapiens, especially with our sophisticated computer algorithms and our environmental sensors, our satellites, are the mightiest managers of systems on the planet. And we must now manage the grazers. That doesn't mean you have to eat them. If you're a dedicated vegetarian or vegan, good on you. You're helping draw down not just carbon, but drawing down the profits of the CAFO feedlot operations. Good job. But remember, we must have animals back on the farm and in the fields if their ecology is to function properly again. If that means rewilding with wolves and coyotes and other predators to help manage the possible overpopulation, or whether it means using IUDs or hormonal or other methods of birth control to keep the animal population in check, so be it. One way or another, the animals need to be put back in the equation. And that equation isn't at all incompatible with increasing the amount of forest, and particularly rainforest. I've mentioned before that the original cows were forest animals called aurochs, like the other ruminants, deer and moose and elk. So while ruminants created the world's great grasslands, they also had a vital role in creating and maintaining the world's great forests. And we have a drawdown solution for recreating this balance. It is silvopasture and it's ranked number nine, so it is important. It's that important. It can draw down 31.19 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent and a net cost of $41.6 billion with a savings of $699.4 billion, so there's no reason not to do it. And it basically involves putting the forest, la selva in Spanish, back into the pasture. Our book reports, quote, research to date suggests silva pasture far outpaces any grassland technique. And that's because silvopastoral systems sequester carbon in both the biomass above the ground and the soil below. Pastures that are strewn or crisscrossed with trees sequester five to ten times as much carbon as those of the same size that are treeless. Moreover, because the livestock yield on a silvopasture plot is higher, it may curtail the need for additional pasture space and thus help avoid deforestation and subsequent carbon emissions. Some studies show that ruminants can better digest silvopastoral forage, emitting lower amounts of methane in the process. People like me who are on the paleo diet will agree from our own fewer farts per food calorie experience once we've cut the grass family from our diet. I can also personally vouch for the idea that cows prefer forest leaves to grass. I saw my first forest cows in the sacred ancient capital of Guatemala, Iximche, the city of the tree of life or breadnut tree and learn from the Maya how much cows prefer shrubs and tree leaves to grass, just as deer do. Then I visited my friend Alonso's bread nut silvopastoral plantation in Mérida, Mexico, near Chichen Itza, where the cows browse, not graze, between the rows of managed low-leafing bread nut trees. And now, Rosebud, I feed our cows regularly on oak leaves and sweet gum leaves and shrubs, as I've mentioned before and I'll mention again. I've even seen them rear up on their hind legs to get at the low-hanging oak branches. A tough thing for a heavy bull, but obviously worth the energy to him. And of course, this drawdown solution implies that we pay urgent attention to drawdown solution number 14, tropical staple trees, the trees that can provide nuts for our daily bread and other staple food needs, rather than our constant reliance on grains and tubers. Staple food trees, or what I call tree cereals, tree cereals, can bring carbon down by 20.19 gigatons at a net cost of $120 billion, while saving $627 billion. No economic reason not to do it. And save the tropical forest and browse a new kind of rainforest-fed beef. Is there? And finally, for the purposes of this lecture, because you can bring in so many more drought on solutions wrapped around the conundrum of cattle, let's briefly talk about solution number 17, tree intercropping. 
Obviously, we don't want to just set up giant plantations of single species of staple trees like Maya breadnut or oceanic breadfruit or coconut or almond flower trees because monocropping is always bad for biodiversity and for the soil and for water consumption, hence the fights about the real sustainability of California's almond milk alternatives to soy and cow milk. What we want is to mix more species of trees than there are in a bowl of mixed nuts. This is exactly what the tree and forest loving former president of Nigeria, His Excellency Oluwasegun Obasanjo, showed me when he invited me to live with him for a few weeks in Abiokuta to build biodigesters at his home and took me around his farms and factories. The former president proudly showed me his intercropped production forest. It had hardwoods for furniture and construction like teak and mahogany and a wide variety of fruit and fiber trees and scattered amongst them, there it was, the African oil palm that scourge of sustainable development whose monocrop plantations are causing the orangutans and the forests they depend on to go extinct in Indonesia. Obasanjo said, but here it is at home where it originated in Africa. And far from harming the forest, it's a part of our forest. All they're doing wrong in the other parts of the world is that they're burning and clear cutting the natural forests and making these awful single species tree gardens to maximize short term profit. It isn't sustainable, of course. Here, I have multiple harvests yielding so many products so there's always a revenue stream no matter what commodity prices do. It's like having a diverse stock portfolio. And of course, trees are livestock. And when we harvest one, we plant two in its place. And unlike the Indonesian plantations where the farmers feel threatened by animals and kill them, we have so much diversity that we can let animals wander through the forest and take some of the harvest then we can harvest them. That's the benefit of silvopasture with intercropping. This story ends not with beef, but with another form of high protein meat that wanders freely through the president's forest farms in West Africa, and one that we were able to buy at the side of the forested sections of road almost everywhere on our drive from Port Harcourt to Lagos. Giant tree snails. Snails are a form of livestock that keep on giving, and they live on trees. Says the BBC Business Report, quote, global demand for giant African land snails is growing, measuring up to 25 centimeters in length and 700 grams in weight. Some are kept as pets, while others are used for cosmetics and food. I guess the real question then isn't whether or not we should stop eating meat to save the climate. The question is why all these sensible and provably cost-effective profit-generating solutions for reintegrating biodiverse assemblages of plants and animals back into ecological coherence is moving at, well, you know, such a snail's pace. That's what I have a beef about, especially when we're in the, when we're in the midst of the Earth's sixth and most threatening extinction crisis mainly due to deforestation and much of it driven by the conversion of forests to pasture and soy and grains to feed animals and feedlots. Especially when all the answers are right there. And this time we can actually have our beefcake and eat it too. Now that is what I call bullcrap. How about you?